Okay, thanks Freddy for uh, the introduction. Uh, good, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks before all for uh, this invitation and for setting up this uh, meeting today. Um, my talk, um, so we will dive a bit into the ocean, uh, but I'm not uh, an oceanographer physicist, so I'm more involved in deep learning for dynamic systems or so through different applications and to uh, ocean dynamics. I want to, to straight ways in, in line with what was presented by Tom, different ways to, to bridge physics and deep learning. And in my talk here, I will mainly focus on inverse problems and, and data, data simulations and through some illustration on, on ocean dynamics. So, and so I, I'd like first to introduce the kind of challenges or topics we'd like to cover regarding ocean observation, ocean modeling and forecasting. And I, I'd like to cover two main messages. One, uh, which is that we can go beyond our networks weird in a black box, so we can uh, put some physics inside or some um, equations inside the neural networks. And uh, also that end-to-end -end learning, I'm not sure all of you are familiar with this, so I'll introduce this if necessary, but that end-to-end -end learning can make the difference when going to our real data and, and, and applications. Okay, so um, so first, the, the kind of topics we we address regarding ocean science. So um, basically, the main point or, or or the key point is that there is no observation or no simulation system that could provide you with all the scales and processes uh, at any point in time and space for for vision. They're probably just the same as for climate or or the atmosphere. So here I create uh, an output of a numerical simulation of the sea surface temperature just to, to let you have an idea if you've never looked at that kind of, those kind of fields of, of the complexity, you can see many different uh, structures uh, with many, many different scales. And uh, so we have probably very good models, but no models cannot reproduce all the patterns you can see in observations. And on the right here, you have, uh, I guess here, some satellite observation here it's for uh, ocean core so the primary production in, in, in the ocean that you can get data on, on this from from satellite and i know the other one here is refer more to uh, some uh, some measurement from space of the uh, sea surface uh, height so the uh, the level or the sea level basically and and what's important here is that uh, from space you only observe the sea surface first and, and usually it, it's really uh, some very coarse and irregular sampling. Okay, so you do not observe, even on the daily scale, you cannot cover from a satellite uh, all the, the global oceans. So there are missing parts in, in some way. And, and the general question we'd like to address is whether we can better combine modeling capacities, capabilities and observation. And, and, and we think that deep learning and machine learning could help in, in, in bridging uh, modeling and, and observation observation system. So I, I try to restrict this for uh, some problems. So, and, and to be a bit more specific, we the kind of, so we mainly deal with uh, inverse problems. So uh, the two basic ones are, or being able to reconstruct in some, uh, some sea ocean variable. Here, uh, I, I will use as an illustration, the sea surface height so the sea level anomaly, which relates to, uh, sea surface currents. So basically, I will have some uh, irregularly sampled observation data from space, so gap data, and I'd like to reconstruct for over a given time period the uh, sea surface state. That would be uh, one, one problem I'd like to address. Another one would be the uh, simulation forecasting. So given some observation up to today, could I forecast the uh, sea surface height, sea surface currents, uh, for a falling weight, for, for example, or would I could I use a past observation to simulate over a longer time period uh, the um, ocean state? So, and, and again, would like to address this uh, using some kind of deep learning uh, items. Um, then beyond this, there might be an additional question. One would be uh, because we have many type of observation data. So one question which uh, arises naturally would be whether we could uh, benefit from uh, different data sources and how we can combine those data sources to get the best possible reconstruction or, or forecasting. 
Uh, and those are very important question for the uh, ocean is also given, given that we have many observations for the sur sea surface, especially from space and, and very, very few uh, for the interior of the ocean because we, are, we may have some gliders or um, profiles diving into the ocean, but very locally. So we may have very scarce data regarding the uh, interior of the ocean. Uh, uh, this question, uh, which is how to combine surface data and a few data for the interior to best reconstruct the uh, global three-dimensional plus time state of vision uh, is an important question. And, and the last one would be, okay, given uh, some observation system which is available, again from space, for example, could I decide where to send new uh, observing devices like uh, um, uh, drones, for example, to sample new observations so that I could uh, improve my forecasting skill or my reconstruction uh, skill. So all those questions would like to address them using uh, some kind of combination of modeling capacities and, and, and deep learning ideas. Okay, so if, if uh, just uh, here, uh, just a very quick introduction to, to deep learning and more specifically to end-to-end uh, -end learning. So what I mean here, is that for a given application, what we call an end-to-end -end architecture, is that for a given application, you can build a neural network here. And to this network, you provide your raw data. So in my case, would be my gap fields, okay? They directly the uh, grid, greedy data com coming from satellite uh, measurements. And I'd like to get as output the uh, variable I'd like to reconstruct. So in my case, would be a, Will be BC surface current. So basically, what we could end to end is, is uh, some model for which you provide as input your raw data, and the output would be uh, the variable you'd like to uh, predict or reconstruct. And uh, end to end learning refers to the idea that if you can provide the system with a number of examples of your input and output data, then you can train your model end to end, meaning you can train all the parameters of a model so that you get the best possible uh, performance metric for the prediction of the output given the, the, the input. And basically, we would like to use this kind of end to end learning uh, strategies for uh, geophysical dynamics. Okay, so if, if you look at the uh, state of the art, uh, there are many. Uh, uh, examples of papers, probably, uh, I don't know, tens or hundreds every day of papers uh, uh, from developing deep learning ideas for physics rate problems. So here I just illustrated a few ones. And many of those uh, contributions use relatively um, off the shelf uh, deep learning architecture, which have uh, been mainly developed in the field of. Uh, uh, let's say computer vision, natural language processing, or but not necessarily initially developed for uh, dealing with uh, geophysical dynamics. Still, they as uh, they still yeah. For many examples, they provide very very good results. So if you try this with the kind of irregularity sample data we have for the uh, ocean observation, it, it doesn't work very well. So the question is, uh, can we do, go? Um, um, beyond this, and can we can we improve the performance of deep learning? Uh, and probably the idea here is that we need additional uh, physical knowledge to and to bring this physical knowledge into the deep learning schemes to improve their their in our case forecasting or reconstruction performance. Yeah, and so I'd like to to, to illustrate. Okay. Okay, so now I will move on to uh, to the, the, the presentation of one framework we, we developed for a data simulation. Um, I will illustrate this for an interpolation problem, okay? So basically, um, the problem would be that I have a series of observations of the sea surface uh, derived from some satellite measurements. And so those data have gaps. So basically for a, Typical application uh, into uh, for the reconstruction of sea surface currents um, uh, using satellite IT data. The observation data cover typically uh, from one to five percent of the uh, global ocean, no more daily. Okay, so we have like the gaps are are, are the the main part of the data. Okay, so we have large uh, missing data rates. 
And so we would expect to get the best possible reconstruction of a time series of a C surface state given this uh, gap -y data. So that's basically some kind of space time relation issue. Okay, so to, to deal with the, this kind of uh, autoregress source problems, the, the, um, the classic or the state of the art, uh, one of the state of the art framework to address this uh, more in earth science relates to data simulation framework. And data simulation uh, systems um, rely on, on three main components. So first you need uh, some forward model. So that would be in my case, some model for ocean dynamics. Okay, uh, let's say I, I could consider here like uh, a state of the model like NEMO, if you know this, but basically uh, um, uh, some state of the art uh, model for the ocean. Then I need to consider uh, some observation model. So um, given the observation from, from uh, satellite atomometry, I need to, to state how this, da this uh, observation data relates to the uh, sea surface state I'd like to, to reconstruct. And the last component is the uh, uh, assimilation scheme. So here I could use a number of different uh, state of real frameworks developed in the literature, like uh, variational data simulation framework, like Kalman based filters, and, and so on. Uh, and, and that's one of the state of the art, uh, that's really the state of the art in operational integration. The thing is, if you look at this, um, the design of the entire system uh, is based on, on, on physics. Uh, principle, but each component is developed independently, okay? And it often uh, in, in for ocean-related uh, applications, uh, there's this drawback that uh, the assimilation framework seem not to be able to fully exploit the, all the scales observed in the observation data, especially regarding five scale information. Okay, so my, my basic question is, uh, can I use, could I use a deep learning to build some kind of end-to-end -end architecture, end-to-end -end scheme? So basically a, a, some kind of neural network to which I would provide as input the gap data and where I would get as output the, uh, the gap-free data, okay, the graded and, and, and gap-free data. And the question would be how to exploit some prior knowledge to build this uh, neural architecture. And I'd like to calibrate this uh, architecture or to learn all the parameters of the architecture entry end, meaning directly to run all the possibly all the components from uh, some data set for which I have the uh, observation data and the true state using learning uh, based setting. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I will first go through uh, the way the, uh, the variational data simulation is stated and then try to build on this to, to design some neural network architecture. So the, the uh, variational data simulation, so for those who have some background in, in, into this, I will consider a weak constraint for the diverse setting. So basically first you need to, uh, you state some kind of state space formulation. So here, what I mentioned before, you need to describe, you need to define some model for the time dynamics of your system. So here my state is X, evolving or according to some uh, dynamical model M. And I need, I would consider here a very simple uh, identity observation model up to some noise here. And where I have the observation only for some, uh, some subset of the, of the uh, global domain. Given this, in the variational data simulation uh, setting, the uh, reconstruction of the state X given the uh, observation Y comes to some kind of minimization with two terms. One term refers to uh, the observation term, and the other one refers to the fact that you expect the state X to be in line with the uh, dynamic described by model I. So here, the operator phi uh, refers to the uh, time uh, to the flow operator, so it refers to the time integration of the differential equation associated to dynamical model. Yeah. Um, so given this, um, this formulation here, where you sum over the time step, you can go to some kind of uh, matrix-based formulation with the two, two terms. And uh, I use this formulation uh, uh, afterwards. And the only difference here, there's no more uh, explicit reference to time, but here X, and, and why 
refer to the states over a given time period. So basically in my case would be like, let's say seven days considering a daily uh, resolution. Okay, so um, meaning that in the model driven or the classic variational data simulation uh, formulation, uh, what I would consider is this kind of minimization and to solve this minimization, uh, I, I can consider different algorithm. The, uh, if I know the, uh, I'm able to compute the gradient of the operator phi, uh, for example, using iTunes methods, then I could use a, a gradient descent to solve for this, okay? So now, um, if I, I, I'd like to consider deep learning uh, algorithm, one, one, the first and, and most straightforward uh, approach would be uh, to consider uh, directly some state-of-the-art uh, architecture like a CNN or some of you may know that it is a wide zoo of uh, neural architectures. So I could use CNN, units, and, and so on. Uh, so I could use some kind of off-the-shelf uh, architecture from deep learning architecture and then to try to train this based on some uh, data set for which I have both the observation data and the true state. So uh, and using so that would be a straightforward application. And I told you for our application, it doesn't work very well because the missing data rate is, is very large, okay? So we'll go for another approach and the kind of formulation we consider is we'd like to solve this uh, B-level optimization formulation. So basically, we, we'd like to, uh, so basically you see the operator phi here, which is uh, here in our form formulation. So we'd like to, to, to learn or infer the best possible representation of the dynamics of, of the state X, given that uh, we have the best possible reconstruction performance. So basically here, X tilde would be the, our reconstruction. Xn is the true state. So we would, like, we would expect the reconstruction to be as close as possible to the true state. So here would be, for example, some kind of mean square error, for example. And so we'd like to, in the end, get the best possible reconstruction so that our reconstruction would be associated to the minimization of a variational cost. And our additional assumption here is that the operation, the operator phi here is implemented as a neural network, okay? I'll come back later on on the kind of neural nets we could consider for, for this. Okay, so, um, so solving for this believer optimization problem and learning from this might be uh, very complex. So we restate it that way where uh, we keep this, this part, but this part here is changed to that where this psi thing here, is the output of some iterative gradient-based solver, uh, which uh, make use of automatic differentiation to get the, the uh, to compute the gradient of variational cost. Okay, so if here the uh, key thing is that if I assume that the operator phi here is a neural network, then it's easy to implement this variational cost uh, within a, a differentiable framework like PyTorch, for example. And then I can uh, get directly uh, the uh, use automatic differentiation to get the gradient of, of this variational cost so that I can directly implement within a network um, the, a gradient descent. Oh no, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it was a bit fast for me. So here, here you, okay. have, you have this phi. So on, yeah. on, on the previous slide, phi was your uh, tendency in your, in, in your time. Yeah. Group. Right, so you want to replace this uh, physical equation by some uh, uh, machine learning learn equation for the evolution of your, of your yeah. field. Is this is this correct? That, that's correct. So meaning, um, so why yeah. don't you use uh, why don't you use uh, uh, what is the, the non equation? Yes. Why don't you okay. use the equation? You you can okay. So here, um, it went just because in my slide here, you see here, I had to minimize over something. So um, it went just to, to be in line with, with this, but uh, okay, if I move here, uh, let's to start, let's consider for phi, phi is known, okay? That you know, you, are, uh, you know your model M and phi is just the uh, uh, time integration of your model M, okay? 
And here, what you learn is a, a solver, the best possible regression based solver, so that you 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 optimize the variational cost as as fast as possible. So that and you'd like the uh, minimization to be as close as possible to the true state. And here, the the uh, the trainable solver implements this iterative update here where you see it's a gradient-based uh, update. So basically in the network at some iteration K, the new uh, state at iteration K plus one is the previous one minus some update, which is based on the, uh, the gradient of the variational cost. And here it's not directly the, uh, some coefficient multiplied by the gradient, by, but you, you change the gradient according to some uh, a neural network, which is a recurrent network. So you can look at this in some way to have some momentum-based uh, gradient rule, uh, iterative gradient rule, like a configured gradient. So in some kind, for example, of generalization of the configured gradient, okay? The idea would be that using this uh, trainable solver, you may um, minimize this cost very fast and possibly get a better uh, reconstruction performance when checking the difference between x at here and the true state. And interestingly, if you do not know the operator phi, then you can also learn uh, the operator phi. And, and what would be interesting in the end is that, is that you can compare the performance knowing or not the operator phi. I, I come back on this later. And what's important is that you, you can uh, learn all the uh, unknown parameters of, of the end-to-end uh, uh, -end architecture according to some uh, performance measure. And for example, the uh, most uh, natural one when considering the reconstruction would be the uh, MSC. So basically you would like the, this uh, guy here to be as close as possible to a true state. Okay. So now I come back to your question, Freddy, is uh, I may have different choices for uh, setting the operator file. So the, the most natural one, if I know the, the dynamics of my state, would be uh, to consider just the, uh, the solver would be the timing, would be based on the timing integration. So the uh, operator file would be uh, the implementation of some time integration scheme, like could be a Euler solver, or you could consider Wenge Kuta uh, solver. It's what we implement. But you can also consider the, another choice where instead of using this, you may use uh, some state of your uh, neural architecture. So in our case, what I'll show afterwards, I use a, a UNet, which is some kind of CNN with some kind of multi-state decomposition. Okay, so now I, I consider an application and illustration of this framework to a Lawrence 96 system. So where the observation data is this, okay? So here I uh, get one observation every four time step. And for each time step, uh, I randomly pick 50% of the uh, 40 components of a Lorentz 96 state, okay? So you see that, uh, so you have many missing data and the idea would be to reconstruct this. So here, what you look, well, the plot here, you have here that's the reconstruction performance, and here that's the uh, four divar uh, score. And here, the, this here, you start from the initial condition, and here, this uh, plot here refers to the uh, classic four divar minimization, so using a fixed step gradient descent. And you see that you're very good regarding the variational uh, uh, score, the four divar score. But in terms of MSC, you're here, okay? So now, if you do what you said, Freddy, so you consider uh, the, uh, our framework, we call this for Divernet, using for operator five, the true, true ODE. So here, we do not learn uh, the operator five. It's, it's assumed to be known. We only train the solver to get the best possible reconstruction. And you see here that you improve the reconstruction performance, which is this. So we are better, the state we construct is better than the one we get from the uh, classic uh, for divar minimization. And now what you can do is instead of considering phi, assuming phi to be known, you, uh, you, you, we train jointly phi 
using some unit uh, architecture jointly to the solver. And here, you again increase a bit the uh, reconstruction performance. And it, it's, it's, uh, and it's relatively significant. We have a gain like about 50%, uh, I think, in that case. So uh, this example may show that uh, the uh, true prior, so meaning the true model, might not be the best prior for inversion uh, problems. So that I have no theoretical uh, insights on this. I, I, I think, and we may discuss this, that may relate to uh, biases, which are known when considering uh, Bayesian inversion. So meaning that if you consider the true model, you know there might be some kind of uh, estimation biases. So, and here maybe it may tell you that uh, the best, be, the true model might not be the, the best product for inversion purposes. Um, so, I, I'd like to, to have an illustration uh, or to let. Oh, no? to, yeah. Okay, we have a question in the, in, yeah. the, in the chat. Can you try to read it? The question is from Nelly. It's going to be easier. Can you read it and, and, and repeat it for the, for the room here? Thank you. Yeah. Patrice, uh, je pense que je te l'ai envoyé qu'à toi. Uh, OK, sorry. So I'm the... I, I can ask the question. Okay. If you hear me. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So I would like to know, but it was uh, when you define the minimization problem where you have your data fidelity term and your prior. So you have an H yeah. and a phi. And if you perform a gradient descent, then you need to compute the H star or H transpose. And the same yeah. for phi. How do you do uh, it? It's not clear for me. Okay, um, here, um, so H in my case, here, previous case, H was the identity, okay? okay. For, uh, it's a mask, or basically it's a mask. Or, uh, it's identity if you observe the point, and, and, and otherwise it, it, it's, um, you do not compute this term here, okay? Here it was to, um, to have it here, uh, yeah, I, I make it, Okay, I, I simplified a bit here, but okay. here this norm is computed over a subset of the domain. Okay, meaning that the derivation of this term is, is, is direct, just the identity operator. Okay. And for this one here, um, we use the automatic differentiation in practice. So meaning that if you uh, implement this in PyTorch, for example, or TensorFlow, you can get direct, if you consider if the operator phi is, is differentiable, then you get directly the, the gradient for free using the autograd uh, function. So automatic differentiation implemented in PyTorch. Okay. So you do not have to uh, compute this analytically. Okay, and you, you, you know how to compute it even if, it, if it's- um... Yeah, if in, 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 yeah, because uh, do you know how it works, the automatic differentiation? Yes, yes, I, I know it. So, yeah, so because the, Operator phi is implemented as a composition of elementary functions. Mm -hmm. It just you just go back to uh, the, uh, the derivative of a combination of two functions basically, and 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 you uh, you iterate this. So that's what's implemented in PyTorch. But you do not in in, in uh, regarding the code. I mean, it's just one line of code where you call this autograd function, which implements this uh, automatic differentiation to. Okay, but you do not have a closed form expression for, for the adjoint of phi. You are obliged to, to use a automatic differentiation. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. the closed form for the uh, discretized version of phi. Okay. Because what we implement is only the uh, discretized version of the, or of the differential uh, scheme and of the um, time integration. Okay. So here I, I do not use the, uh, yeah, the closed form if I have it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, here, here are examples of uh, more real-world application to uh, space oceanography for space-time interpolation. So here, maybe one illustration here, it's the kind of result we have. They, so here, the top left is the uh, ground truth. So that's the surface current. The top right is the kind of observation data we have. Uh, the top bottom left is the, uh, some optimal interpretations of the operational processing, and the bottom right is what we recover the, using the, this uh, neural network uh, method. So you see that we basically improve the reconstruction of the gradients, and we get a better uh, reconstruction for gradient sources and, and FASCA information. 
And I, I've added this, this example here, which is interesting because in that case, we can train the, uh, the, the, the model, the network directly for, from real data with gaps, okay? So defend, depending on the current configuration, we may train the data with uh, gap-free data, or in some cases, if the missing data rate is not too large, let's say uh, up to 50%, uh, we may be able to train the, the model di directly from uh, the observation data. Okay, so the, the key messages here, so what I wanted to illustrate is uh, here using, uh, we can, uh, what I've shown is that we can build neural networks which are based on variational data assimilation formulation. So meaning that they, um, in, they, you have like two main components here in this architecture, the variational cost and the gradient-based solver. We may be able to train end-to-end -end, uh, the uh, different trainable components. So here I've only uh, illustrated something with it for a prior and the solver, but in some cases you may also uh, train the observation model. For example, we have application where we consider a, a multi-source data, for example, sea surface temperature and, and, and satellite emit altimetry. And in that case, we have some kind of trainable observation component to relate sea surface temperature to sea surface current. And we're able to train all the component uh, from, from entry end, from raw data. And I've illustrated here applications to interpolation that we have the same kind of uh, results for forecasting and, and currently more for short term forecasting. Um, that's relatively easy to scale up to a, a, a global uh, scale. Uh, that's really the power of uh, using deep learning. Uh, uh, frameworks like PyTorch, it makes it very easy to, to scale up to a more large data set. And here, a very important thing is this entry and learning, which uh, makes it very uh, uh, quick to, again, to move from a toy example like, like Lawrence to true data set, uh, where we can train everything from uh, raw data. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I assume I'm, I'm, I'm done regarding... Uh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, so yeah, I, I won't cover this. Um, yeah, just thank you for, for listening. I've just included a few, uh, some references uh, uh, provided with a slide of sorts. Thanks all. Thanks a lot. Do you have, do you have questions for, for Ronan? For the Milosevic? So, George is a uh, is a postdoc uh, funded by the project uh, uh, academics. So it's, he's working with uh, uh, Pierre, Patrice, and uh, myself. So he, he will talk about uh, probabilistic forecasting of heat waves with uh, uh, deep learning. Okay. Uh, so we'll just use this. No, that doesn't work. Uh, which one am I supposed to? Slide the slide. Ah, okay. We'll have them on one side. Ça marche pas. Ça aide. It will work even. It will work, okay. Yeah. Will work. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, it will work. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, as stated, uh, the, I'm going to talk about uh, probabilistic forecasting of heat waves uh, with uh, machine learning. Uh, so, uh, machine learning uh, has been already applied 
for um, forecasting heat waves. Uh, for example, in, oops, sorry. Yes, uh, in this work, uh, but we wanted to make a probabilistic forecasting. And here's a, another example of uh, using a methodology developed for object classification and applying it uh, for, um, uh, for, class, for, for finding uh, extreme events. Uh, in this case, these are tropical cyclones on here. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly jump through the introduction to machine learning and then how it is used in computational earth sciences. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, my work uh, in this group and about our future work. Okay, so as you know, machine learning consists of uh, various fields. We will be interested in this talk in supervised learning. Uh, and uh, well, you've seen these images very often. So this is a feed forward neural network. You have to optimize cost function uh, by using a back propagation algorithm uh, to, uh, to optimize the weights basically. Uh, okay, so how is this used in, what, what does this have to do with uh, computational earth sciences? So uh, historically, pattern recognition was used as the main method for, for, uh, for meteorological forecasting. Um, and that's how the method of analogs was developed. But uh, of course, with the development of uh, numerical weather prediction, uh, we started relying more on um, physical models. Uh, however, we are observing that uh, as uh, our need for more precise models uh, increases, uh, we need uh, finer grids, uh, we need better parameterizations. And so um, the problem is that uh, uh, the, the Moore scaling, or in this case, Denner scaling, uh, which refers to the uh, arithmetic speed of computers, it is leveling off. And uh, so uh, we are looking for other ways to um, somehow extract information uh, without having to run very, very complex models or finding shortcuts. Uh, so uh, machine learning has shown uh, its success in prediction of uh, uh, events such as El Nino Southern Oscillation in the long term. So here you see uh, here you see the index of El Nino as a function of uh, years, uh, and black is observation, and this is a convolutional neural network prediction. And this is the model, and so you can see that it's working relatively well. Um, also, the method of analogs uh, may work well in, in, in these situations. Uh, okay, so uh, in, in this work, uh, we were interested in working with uh, uh, general circulation models to uh, predict extreme heat waves. So this is the uh, extreme heat wave that happened in uh, Europe in 2003. Uh, this is the temperature uh, plotted here. Unfortunately, you cannot read this, but this goes from minus 10 to 10. So this is a, a monthly mean. So it's a pretty high uh, anomaly. Uh, so it cannot be attributed to uh, climate change completely. Uh, but um, questions like this are being asked. So for example, uh, people wonder, uh, with continual climate change, uh, given that the distribution of uh, of the of the events are shifting um, and also the variance may change uh, they wonder how what will be the frequency of heat waves for example so this is another question that is, that is important to address and it's difficult to address because how rare heat waves are so in order to collect good statistics you have to run climate models for a very long time so this is complicated okay so well, let's move to our work. Or yeah, actually, yeah, before we move to our work, uh, let's talk a little bit about heat waves. So this is an example of Scandinavian uh, blocking uh, event in 2018. So here you have a map of uh, um, geopotential and temperature superimposed on each other. So temperature is blue uh, to red again. 
And uh, this is geopotential. So geopotential is geopotential at 500 millibars, uh, which is typically used for forecasting. Um, it is a pressure, uh, basically, for physicists. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, quasi-geostrophic flow, it sort of flows um, parallel to, uh, um, to the geopotential. So here you could say that there is a direction coming from the south. And uh, in general, when you, uh, this is not necessarily true for heat waves in Scandinavia. In fact, it's not true for heat waves in Scandinavia. But in general, uh, heat waves may uh, also be uh, caused by dry soil. So if you have dry soil, you're more likely going to have uh, a heat wave because uh, there aren't, uh, there's not enough evaporation. Okay, so this, this particular event here in Scandinavia, uh, this is uh, the time series for the uh, area integral over the, um, over this, this area of Scandinavia. Uh, so here in blue, you see the time series. And in July, it sort of peaks and it's, uh, it's above uh, the norm for a very long time. And in orange, I plotted the running mean. So here I plotted the 30 day running mean, um, which means that you're, you're integrating forward in time. So it starts to increase before an actual event, of course. Uh, and it's quite large. So it's uh, about three degrees uh, for, for 30 days. Okay, so, oops, go back. Okay, so uh, what is the definition that we will use for a heat wave? We will use the simple definition, uh, which is, uh, so you take the area that you're interested in. So in, in this case, it will be the area of France because we are in France, for example. And uh, um, T is the temp two meter temperature, which is relevant for humans. Uh, and uh, this is the average. So basically we're looking at the anomaly um, and um, uh, you integrate this also in time. This is the running mean. It will be the 14 days because we will look for at 14 day events. Uh, this corresponds to um, in our climate model uh, where, where we, had a we, we had a simulation uh, with the climate model and I'm gonna talk about a bit later. This, these are like the superimposed time series and uh, we are looking at the extreme so in other words, if you were to, uh, to make a histogram, we're looking at the extreme here. Okay, so the model that we're, going, we're using uh, is um, uh, called PLASM, Planet Simulator. Uh, and it's a model that sometimes appears in the IPCC reports. Uh, at least the, I mean, it's, it's in the intermediate complexity model. Uh, so it, uh, it has the resolution that you can see basically here, I'm, I'm plotting the grid um, on top of the uh, map of the Earth. So the resolution is uh, about three degrees by three degrees. It's quite coarse, so 100 kilometers. Um, but it allows us to uh, simulate this for this model for 8,000 years, which is a lot. So it gives us a lot of statistics. So here I'm plotting uh, the analysis of. Uh, uh, the frequency, this is something that uh, one may care about if one wants to make predictions about uh, uh, what is the return time, for example, of certain heat waves. Here I'm plotting the, uh, uh, the temperature anomaly, uh, and here I'm plotting the number of years you have to wait for this anomaly to happen. Mm -hmm. And in this orange uh, curve that you should, uh, field line that you should uh, uh, concentrate on, um, uh, uh, this is this is the one that we get from uh, plasm. So what this cur what this graph shows us is that in if you wait ten years, then you will have a four degree uh, heat wave. Uh, okay, uh, in yearly heat wave will be four degrees. And uh, these dotted lines are the dotted points are uh, reanalysis. So reanalysis is uh, is the database. Uh, that uh, is based on data assimilation from the observations. And so it shows you, uh, it actually surprisingly well matches this model, even though it's so uh, simple. This mo I mean, it's not actually the simplest model. You can have more simple models, but uh, it's not as complex as some other models that uh, are more costly. Okay, so uh, what are we interested in? We're interested in finding the probability, the conditional probability 
uh, of detecting a heat wave. Uh, so given some condition X, okay, so um, uh, meteorologists use different uh, kinds of scores. And the score that we find most adapted for our purposes is a logarithmic score. Uh, and in machine learning is known as cross entropy, is related to cross entropy. Um, and the reason we choose it is because it's suitable for rare events. So it's because of the logarithmic dependence here, it is sensitive to uh, small probabilities. So here I'm writing it in general for the multi-class classification. Um, and the K will be two for us because we're doing binary classification. In uh, the limit of large data set, you can represent this, of course, as uh, Shannon's entropy and uh, kublik libel divergence, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to approximate the true probability with the probability that the, the, the neural network serves us with. And the scale score that we will be reporting, this is the important point, uh, we call it normalized skill score. And uh, here, basically, the thing is that you want to make sure that uh, the value that you get uh, from the logarithmic score, it has to be compared uh, with a very simple prediction that is just climatology. In other words, uh, knowing, for example, what is, uh, on average, the number of heat waves uh, at, at this point, you could already make a prediction. For example, the probability is 5% a priori. You could already assign this uh, as a prediction. And uh, basically, we want to beat this. So uh, this score is defined, uh, designed in such a way that if it is 1, then it's a perfect prediction, which is not possible. If it is 0, then it's as good as climatology, which means it's not, it's not good. And it can be less. So it's uh, for a very bad prediction. OK, so now, uh, yeah, so for, for probabilistic prediction, what one uses in neural networks often is a softmax, uh, which makes sure that your, um, the output of a neural network is in a range from 0 to 1. Uh, so this is a plot of a sigmoid uh, for binary classification. I, even though I'm doing binary classification, I'm still relying on the apparatus that can be easily generalized to multi-class classification. Uh, in this case, it's called softmax. Uh, so uh, the label one will correspond to a heat wave. The label zero will correspond to not heat wave. And uh, the way we will define a heat wave here is also quite simple. It's just the 95th percentile. Of, so like the largest 5% of A, A that was this, the, defined earlier, which is the 14 day running mean of temperature <clears throat> integrated over the area of France. Uh, so our input will consist of, um, uh, in general, of three fields. So the two meter temperature, so predicting temperature with temperature, the um, 500 millibar geopotential, which is, uh, has more global information that's encoded in it. And therefore, we are using the whole field above 30 degrees north uh, uh, in the North Hemisphere, which is relevant for heat waves in France. And uh, we are also going to rely on soil moisture because, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is an important parameter. Okay, so uh, then you do the standard uh, K fold class, uh, K, uh, K fold uh, uh, um, uh, cross validation. Um, and okay, let me move this. We do this in order to um, be able to say what's the uncertainty of our score. Um, and this is the architecture. So we are using a, a convolutional neural network um, because you know this way you have fewer neurons uh, to worry about. And um, for in, in general, for us actually, the fact that it's translationally invariant may not be the best su suitable choice, but uh, it allows us to uh, have fewer neurons. I would say. Uh, okay, so this is the input. You put it through a convolution, uh, through a max pool filter, through a convolution max pool, and uh, then through a soft max after you flatten it. So this is pretty uh, standard. And uh, so, okay, so here we present uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, normalized skill score as a function of tau. Yeah. Uh, as a function of tau. 
uh, versus uh, different combina combinations of fields. Because now that we can decide what to put, put inside our neural network, we can see how well these fields perform. And this way we will know, or at least we will we'll find what, uh, what matters for the neural network to make the prediction. So the best combination is of course to take all three of them. And in this case, uh, when tau is equal to zero, which means I think I have not defined it in words, it was on the slide, but tau is the lag time before the, uh, from the, uh, for the heat wave and the data that the neural network sees. Okay, so, um, so when tau is equal to zero, then uh, we get um, this score. This is um, a number from zero to one. So it's much less than one, but it's also larger than zero. Uh, it's not easy to predict a heat wave at tau equals zero simply because uh, we are uh, we are trying to predict um, 14 days ahead of time. So we're trying to predict uh, the running mean that is 14 days long. So of course you will not get a scale of one. Okay, and then of course it deteriorates and it deteriorates as, as the tau increases uh, up to one month. Um, and uh, well, you might ask, okay, so why does it flatten like this? And uh, so what we did is, as I said, we are looking at different combinations. So the different combinations uh, include uh, just taking geopotential, which is CG and uh, for example, soil moisture. And this is uh, essentially equivalent to our best uh, combination. So in other words, temperature doesn't play a big role here. Um, and then we have this orange curve, which is, uh, the uh, temperature and soil moisture. And you start to see that soil moisture plays a big role. So soil moisture plays a big role in a long-term prediction and it does not deteriorate very much. Um, okay, so this is our like one conclusion and, and the, the, the global geopotential uh, gives you uh, information uh, early on. Okay, so let's move on. So another thing that's important to check is uh, how much data do you need in order to make a prediction? So uh, we have a lot of data. We have 8,000 years, but uh, oftentimes uh, what people do in practice is they use reanalysis, which means you only have up to 70 years of reliable data. And so that's not a lot. Um, so we also performed data reduction uh, study where we were looking at uh, subsets. So, so there are two, basically here you see four lines, but they correspond to uh, uh, two things that we're changing. So we're changing uh, the number of uh, years that we used in order to perform the training. And we are changing uh, what kind of information we provide the neural network. Uh, so the information is uh, limited to either like full information or just the North Atlantic, because we expect the North Atlantic to play a big role in the, in the prediction. Uh, but we also hope to extract some extra information uh, from, uh, uh, from, from uh, outside region. So these are often called uh, teleconnection patterns. Um, so what we see is that, so of course, when you have less data, this is these two curves, you're going to perform worse, okay? So, um, in fact, uh, what you are seeing here, because it's 800 years, is even worse than in the previous slide. So in the previous slide, there was 7,200 years. Um, here you have 800 years. This is the reduction. And then we go to this. Uh, but the, the observation that's interesting is that uh, when, you, um, when you go to as low as 100 years, then you see that this red curve, uh, which uh, corresponds to the training performed on the North Atlantic region, uh, actually outperforms the training that uh, was performed on the uh, global region, uh, which is contrary to what happens when you have um, even 800 years. So the amount of data matters. This makes sense, but I guess having sort of a, a more accurate estimation about how much data you need in order to be able to extract information that's global is uh, perhaps interesting to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so I'm going to the next slide. So we also want to know what the, the neural network looks at when it makes a prediction. Um, uh, normally, well, well, basically currently, we have a PhD student who is working on uh, figuring this out using saliency maps, this is Alessandro. 
Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so we are very interested in that. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, I will only show you the composite maps. So composite maps means that I'm taking the mean um, and I'm conditioning it in this case to the, uh, uh, to the only to the data which uh, the network thought were heat waves with a very high probability. Um, so this is a really high probability. Um, and I'm doing this for um, a set of tau. So in other words, this is tau, tau equals zero means that's when the heat wave starts. And uh, so when you perform this composite, you see this kind of a, uh, here unfortunately you don't have a color map, but it's, you cannot see well the uh, numbers, but uh, each level, this is levels of geopotential, uh, they are 20 meters. Uh, if you're wondering, and this is positive and this is negative. The fact that this is positive makes sense because the heat wave is going to uh, be correlated with uh, a positive anomaly of geopotential because I'm looking at summer. This is another thing which I forgot to mention, I think. Um, and, um, uh, and here you have uh, the uh, negative um, um, anomaly. And so we have this kind of a triple structure that, it, that, it, that uh, corresponds to those, those, um, uh, those um, data points which were ranked as a heat wave correct, cor correctly. Um, then um, here, um, here we have tau equals minus five, which means we're five days ahead. And here we have tau equals minus 10. And what you see is that this uh, pattern shifts a little bit. Um, yeah, so surprisingly, we don't see, uh, for instance, uh, uh, we don't see this anticyclone move here, uh, but we see some kind of shift um, towards the other two nodes of, of this tripole. And we also see a shift that is here. So we haven't really fully understood this yet, but this is, a, this is an observation. But I think that really interesting things will come out of the saliency map because um, uh, when you do a saliency map, then you, you can uh, measure uh, using your neural network uh, where the gradient is largest. And this way you can sort of see what's important in your image uh, for making the classification. Okay, so the future work uh, it could be interesting in this group uh, is uh, applying uh, this neural network to the rare event algorithm. So rare event algorithm, there are different versions of rare event algorithm, but uh, this is the one that is likely to be used. It's a genealogical rare event algorithm, um, simply because we are trying to predict uh, events which are time dependent. Uh, and uh, uh, if you know the commuter function in advance, uh, sorry, I didn't define commuter function. This is a conditional probability for us. If you already know the, if you have an estimate of the conditional probability uh, of the heat wave, you can use this information for your genealogical rare event algorithm because you could uh, then uh, basically trim your uh, runs. So you could choose the simulations which have the characteristics that are likely to be heat waves. And this way you can do the important sampling. So you can shift the, the probability of uh, events, which uh, uh, normally this would be a very rare event, for example, it becomes a relatively common effect, common uh, event. And from uh, other analysis that I have done, it's obvious that if you don't have enough heat waves, it's, it's difficult to also make predictions about them and it's difficult to study them. Um, so it's, it's the heat wave events that are particularly important for, for the prediction and not so much the not heat wave events. Uh, okay, so uh, in my work, uh, I've, uh, when I was doing this training, I've noticed that uh, when uh, you train uh, independently, uh, the, this neural network for each value of tau, uh, then what happens is that uh, it, as a function of tau, you might get something which is not uh, smooth. Uh, and uh, this could be caused by the fact that um, uh, your neural network gets trapped in some local um, minima uh, because you're optimizing independently. Uh, and so then uh, uh, what was obvious to do was to do transfer learning. So it's also faster to train like this. So you initialize uh, maybe from randomly the, uh, the first uh, one, which corresponds to tau equals zero. And then you have to train uh, the next day. 
uh, but you do the transfer learning from the previous day. Uh, we try to do fine tuning and other techniques, but it seems to be that it doesn't matter. Like uh, if you just transfer learn, it's the most optimal way. Um, and then you get this blue curve, which is uh, more smooth. So, so you have to think of like tau equals zero is when the heat wave starts. And this particular event I've chosen in my favor because it's the one where the heat wave, where, where, where the neural network correctly guesses that this is a, a heat wave. Um, and uh, you would like um, uh, for, for this uh, probability to increase as you get closer and closer to the, uh, to the event. And in this case, the time is running backwards. Because I mean, larger tau means we are backwards in time. Okay, so uh, another things that I'm working on is uh, yeah, uh, that I worked on is the analog method. So this is sort of going back to pattern recognition in some ways, but it's a little bit more complicated because this is a Markov chain where uh, if we are in the feature space um, and these are other sort of, uh, so okay, so, it, so we take the data, uh, the, the data is X and uh, the data may have analogs close to it. And uh, we try to construct synthetic trajectories uh, based on, uh, on the data that we already made. So this 8,000 years of simulation, for example. And uh, this was work uh, done by Dario. And uh, Dario found, Dario and me, we found that it's not so easy to uh, uh, apply this method for predicting heat waves. Or you can do this, but you get a skill that's worse than with a neural network. And uh, you cannot really extract the global information. And we think it sort of makes sense because if you, the global information that is stored in Joe Potential, it's uh, very high dimensional. So then one possibility is to perform um, various kinds of uh, dimensionality reductions. And typically in machine learning, the people often use, uh, you know, some version of autoencoder. Um, yeah, there are, there are many ways to do that. So this is something that we are working on. Uh, and then of course, what would be interesting to do of, uh, would be to use uh, the ways that we've trained on, on intermediate complexity model. And we also have data available to us, which uh, from, from a CSM, which is a, a high complexity climate model. And we would like to apply so to the transfer learning to there. And this way we would benefit from a large data pool of PLASM and uh, the more sort of fidelity of CSM. And then perhaps uh, also do, do this uh, next step to reanalysis. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is my talk uh, and thanks for all my collaborators. Bonjour.